Okay, the camera starts and we're on. We're live. Um, welcome back. Thank you so much for coming on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. I'm really grateful to have the audience. Please keep active and ask me questions and, and, and keep continuing to point out um, minus sign errors and those kinds of things because it is – people will be watching this and – you know, it's not just like a – whiteboards are great because you can erase them at the end and any mistake you made vanishes into the wind. And this this is a little bit more higher stakes for me. Not that I mind, but it's uh, exciting. Um, so to, so late last time we, 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 we began our review of signals and systems, I think if you look across the course of the day, we did a pretty good job covering Chapter 2. Uh, now, certainly Chapter 2 has some, has some other stuff in it, um, but I, 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 I tried to not – not dwell on edge and every detail, but rather hit the high points and sort of thread together some of the things that you know already um, and put it into a context that's better um, or more fuller. Today, we're, we're going to – we'll just start with a Fourier series. And this morning, um, I think we'll get we'll – certainly get we'll certainly do a good job on Fourier series. We might even get into Fourier transforms in this first lecture. Uh, maybe, maybe not. We'll sit. There's no race, no rush, so it's not a big deal in any, either way. Um, so again, we have a long day ahead of us, uh, 9 o'clock, 10.30, 1 o'clock, and 2.30. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll bear with us and we'll get through this. Um, the, my, I think what we'll do is we'll begin, we'll at least get into Chapter 4 by the end of the day. Um, and one of the most important, one of the, one of the elements that I want to talk about that, that um, you probably haven't seen a lot of is the modulator, or rather the multiplier. And then, so I want, to, I want to talk about that from both the, the, the theory of that and also the, um, the realization of those. And, and, and if I can get through that today, that'll be a really nice parcel. If not, no big deal. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just see what, what comes. Okay? Now, last time, we looked at a, a, a math fact, which was orthogonality. And in particular, the orthogonality – in particular, uh, the orthogonality of sines and cosines. And so here's an expression for an integral that multiplies the, a cosine by another cosine. Both of these cosines have a fundamental period. 2 pi over t naught is omega naught. So they share a common period. They share a common fundamental frequency. But you can look at these as harmonics of that, of that common fundamental frequency. And so, and so if, um, if n is equal to 1, that's the fundamental cosine of omega naught t. If n is 17, then that's the 17th harmonic. And so, and so now what I'm doing is I'm multiplying cosine of n omega naught t multiplied by cosine m omega naught t. Last time what we, what we, we worked with this is we showed the um, – we, we uh, did the trig identity, cosine A, cosine B, and that gives you an N plus M frequency, and it also gives you an N minus M frequency. And if you're integrating over, over a period, the fundamental period, uh, whenever I have a cosine there, a cosine of some integer multiplied by omega naught t, I'm going to get a zero, because that, that, that cosine is going to be half above the axis and half below the axis. And the, and, the, and the parts above north of the axis are going to cancel with the parts south of the axis. However, there's one very, very special case where if n is equal to m, if n is equal to m, then this expression become co becomes a cosine squared of that frequency. That cosine squared has a DC term. It has a zero frequency term. From the trig identity, it comes from the n minus m equals zero. All that we went over last time. The math is, the math is at the tail, the tail end of that last lecture. Um, and and as, an upshot, as an upshot, there's two answers to this depending on whether we, n equals m or, or, or depending on whether n does not equal m. So for the very, very, very special case of n exactly equal to m, those two integers being the same, 27 and 27, 32 and 32, 1 and 1. Um, then T naught, then T naught is, uh, then, then this integral, this overlap integral is equal to T naught over 2. And that's a type of a dot product. 
That's a type of a dot product where I take this signal, multiply it by this signal, and sum up all the sum the vectors. Okay, sum the vectors. And so if I do that, then then um, then uh, I, I, uh, if those two are the same, I get I get um, I get an answer. I get a non-zero answer. Otherwise, it goes away. It's zero. So you can look at these cosines as being at right angles to each other. In all in 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 an in an, in an infinite dimensional space. And they're only, they're only not right angles if they're the same cosine, if they're the same vector, okay? So I'm looking at it as a function, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a cosine, as a function, an analytic function. But if I, if I run this into MATLAB and I print out, you know, 4096 um, values of that, that's going to be a vector. And that vector dotted with another vector uh, obeys these guys. So we can say that this function, or the vector that fun comes from this function, is, pr is orthogonal to this function, or the vector that comes from that function. And that's a huge, that's a huge uh, advantage in communications. It's the, it's the essence of frequency division multiple axis. Uh, it's, the, it's the essence of, having, of assigning different uh, carrier frequencies to different, um, to different uh, radio stations and having, and, and, being, and having them be able to um, broadcast in the same shared airspace, the same market, um, and have us be able to, 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 to uh, listen to one radio station and not the other, to be able to reject other, other radio stations. Okay, so, so this is also true. We did this for cosine, but this is also true for sines. And of course, since I did this, in co this completely, um, if, you, if you have questions about it or if you're not 100% comfortable with it, then you can take this guy here and in four lines show that, show that this, this, is, this equality is true as well. And so I recommend that as an exercise. It's not very long, but it'll help you solidify the knowledge of, of using that trig identity to show this. And maybe you'll uncover, a, when you do that, maybe you'll uncover a rough spot that you can think yourself through. And that's, that's, a, val that's, a, that's a valuable exercise. Uh, so sines also behave the same way. And if you remember, sines and cosines are always perpendicular to each other. And so that's just plain equal to zero. And uh, there's one little fact here is n cannot equal zero and m cannot equal zero. So these have to be integer numbers, counting numbers non-zero numbers. So sines and cosines are orthogonal. And what we'll do that what we'll do today when we look at Fourier series is we'll use that 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 principle of orthogonality to be able to calculate a Fourier series. And here's how that works. Now I'll start with um, a function f of t an arbitrary function f of t. It's not quite arbitrary, however. We're going to assume, and we're going to do this for now, and we'll change it around in a second, that this function is periodic. So we'll assume that this function is periodic. Now, Remind me to, will you remind me uh, to consider the case, to talk about the case where it's not periodic um, and come back to that. But if it's periodic, then what I'd like to do is I'd like to expand this function into a sum of sines and cosines. Into a sum of sines and cosines. So there's a, there's a, a set of cosine terms that I, argue, that I give, a, that I give a, a, a weight of, I have a weight coefficient in front of each of those cosine terms, a sub n. And I have a bunch of sine terms, those are perpendicular or, or, th or, or 90 degrees out of phase from the, the cosine terms. And those are, those are um, I assign those values, I assign the weights of those as B sub n. And then you can see in the front I have a special case, but it's really not a special case. This A naught here is just a number. 
it's, uh, it's, it happens to be, I use notation A because I'm using the notation A in front of a cosine. And if this cosine is, if n equals zero, then the cosine has zero frequency and I'm left with a, with a DC term. Do you remember we talked about, we talked about that was we pulled the two spikes of the cosine together at zero frequency, it became a DC term. This, this number here is, is therefore the average or the DC uh, of, of whatever signal f of t I happen to have. Okay? Now, there's a variety of premises for this. The first is to note that if I have a fundamental period t naught, then this guy here is 2 pi over t naught. That sounds like a reasonable connection uh, for, for, the, for the frequencies. So the fact that this is periodic, um, you start to think in terms of cosines and sines with the same period, and so that's one, one reason why you might think, or what people might think, to use this as, a, uh, as an expansion set. It's not terribly far-fetched, if you think about it, because we know that cosines can be expressed as a Taylor series, an infinite Taylor series. Remember, I'm summing over in infinite terms. And, and sines can be expressed as an infinite Taylor series. And you may remember that any, fu any function can be expressed as an infinite polynomial or a Taylor series. And so really, really at some level, what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm, just mapping, I'm just mapping Taylor series to Taylor series, although that's a really cumbersome way to think about it. And, and we'll see maybe at the end of this lecture or next lecture, if I feel like giving that part of the lecture, then I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk about why we like Fourier series uh, better than, um, than Taylor series. Okay, um, so there we have it, and, and, and so it, it seems like a reasonable assumption, although it escaped the notice of a lot of mathematicians until the 1700s, and, and um, now the problem is, well, what are the A's and what are the B's? That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the tricky thing, and, and that's where we're going to, um, that's where we're going to uh, uh, look at our, our orthogonality. So the first thing what we'll do is we'll integrate both sides. And since a period of this periodic function, if the period of this periodic function contains all the information of that function, everything is repeated every period, so if I just focus in on a period, I'm getting, the, I'm getting all the details of the function. So if I just integrate that across the period, then I have a pretty good sense of what's going on with this function. And if I integrate the right-hand side, I have the integral of a naught dt across that period. And then I have the summation, n equals 1 to infinity, of the integral of each one of those terms. And each of these guys is integrated over a period. Um, I skipped a step. What step did I skip in that? I integrated both sides. But what step did I, did I, did I skip? It's such a small step that it, it won't jump out at you. I can distribute the integration across each one of those terms. So I can integrate and add or add and integrate. I can integrate and add and add and integrate. So if I really wanted to, there'd be one big integration across this entire term. And so I'd, like I said, it's a, such a small, such a very small math fact that you don't, we don't need to, to talk about it, but it's, it's helpful, I think, to mention it in case somebody was stressed out about it. What do I do with this mess? Can I simplify, any, any, any obvious simplifications? I'm going to ask this because we, I, I'm going to push a little bit on this, on this question because we've done this uh, several times you know, over the course of the last few lectures. So is there, is there a simplification that I can do? I have, I have four kinds of terms there. Like pulling constants out or Yeah, we could do that, but, but, but that's, a, that's, a, that's, yeah, sure, but that's not going to get us, that's not going to be able to let me take my red pen here and draw a line through some of these terms and make it simpler. 
which I really want to do because I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by having an infinite number of terms there. Um, set it to over one Let me remind you of what we're doing. We want to find the A's and the B's. Yep, why? Yep, yep, exactly right. And again, we've, done, we've, made, that, we've made that statement uh, uh, several times over the course of yesterday's lecture and, and to the, even this morning. Um, this cosine here is over a period. It spends half the time above the axis, half the time below the axis. It's out of there. Same with the sign. It's out of there. And you know, you have you've no idea how nice it is to draw those two red lines and eliminate an infinite number of terms from my equation. And, and still have something left over to show for it. It'd be bittersweet if I just made everything go away. But this way, I get, I get, I get rid of just a, 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 an awful lot of, 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 of issues. That's a little note there. And so, um, the first conclusion is that the other world here is A naught times T naught. I'm interested in finding the A's and the B's, so I'm interested in, in solving that equation for, for T naught. And so this is equal to T naught F of T dt. If you can't see the, the piece of the paper that I'm writing on, yell, please. Okay. So, so if I look at that equation and I say, first, the first thing I say is from a shut up and calculate perspective, I have a formula for calculating A naught. From a shut up and calculate perspective, I have, I have a formula for, for calculating A naught, which is all I really need. I, w I set out to find, a formula, find formulas to find A's and B's, and here's my first one. I've got an infinite number to go, so maybe I'm not too cocky right now, but, but, but it's a start, okay? And, and, and then the physical interpretation, or the intuitive interpretation of that, is if I have a function f of t, and I, I add up all of its terms, and then I divide over the length of time that I, I add up those terms, that's an average. That's the average of that function. So A naught is the average value of, the, of F of T. Oh, and by the way, we, we noticed that that was also the DC term. Of the function. It's the DC term of the function. So if I put a blocking cap, if I have this, if I have this F of T as a signal, and I put a blocking cap... In, in, in series to block out the DC, I, I move the whole a I move the whole function down so that it's symmetric above the axis. I lose the DC battery component, and that's called an AC coupled signal. That's called an AC coupled signal. And so, and, and a lot of times, a lot of times in, in working in instrumentation, uh, and, and and also and also reasonably often in, in telecom, uh, we want those AC coupled signals. Not always, not always, but sometimes. But that's a, that's a very, very common trick. Okay. So I know a couple of you guys came in a, a, a little bit after the, um, the start of the camera. This is our sixth lecture of the of this course. Uh, we're, we're doing a review of chapters two and three, and this morning we're, we find ourselves sort of at the beginning of chapter three. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at, at, at Fourier series and Fourier transforms. Our starting point was the orthogonality of functions, in particular cosines and sines. They're not the only orthogonal functions out there. There's a lot of other orthogonal functions. Um, and, and, uh, but, but for our, and I'll use, a, I'll use a term of art called the basis set, we, engin electrical engineers, um, engineers in general, but electrical engineers in particular, really like sines and cosines as their favorite basis set, their favorite set to expand a function as, a set, as an infinite sum of sines and cosines. 
So if I had other if I had other sides if I had other functions that were orthogonal, I could have other expansion sets. And, be, and, and there are there are out there. In fact, we'll meet one later on in this semester, very very casually, just a passing glance, just a quick handshake at a cocktail party called the Bessel functions. Okay, it used to be that we it used to be that, that um, uh, electrical engineers and Bessel functions were really really good buds, but that's that, that's sort of gone away. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the good reasons for that is most calculators have a Bessel function key on them. Okay. I haven't checked if my scientific calculator on my Android has one. But I know that Excel does. And I know that MATLAB does. And those are, those are, those are de decent enough um, um, uh, calculators. So we start by looking at the Fourier series of a function. Uh, we're making the assumption that we're going to get rid of, as, as soon as you throw a piece of paper at me to make sure I'm, I'm, I remember it, um, that it's periodic. We expand it as sines and cosines, which are periodic in that function. The, jet, the job is to find the A's and B's. And we've just found one of, one of an infinite number of, of coefficients. And so we're very, very happy about that. We're also very happy about that because we, have, we now have something of an approach to getting the rest of them especially since we prime the pump by talking about orthogonality as a pretty critical, as a pretty critical uh, piece. Can you read that? Uh, multiply both sides by the cosine of m omega naught t. Remember, notice that this the Fourier expansion, I wrote it in terms of the index n. I wrote it in terms of the index n. So these are cosine of n omega naught t and the sines of n omega naught t. So I'm multiplying through by a cosine that can be a different harmonic. Of that, of that of that series, and so now I and then now I integrate. I multiply the left hand side, and I have that. This is an integral. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. You should phrase the question. Hey, Bozo, slide the paper over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that would be more effective. Because <laughs> I'm looking at the paper and I'm saying, "That's you." How can you not recognize that as an integral side? Well, if it's not on the board, you can't. Uh, all right. So you integrate uh, both sides. Here's the, uh, you multiply through by cosine of m omega t. Here's my cosine of m omega t. You integrate both sides. So here's my first term, f of t, cosine of m omega t. My right-hand side, the first term is that a naught times the integral of that cosine omega naught, omega m, omega naught of t. You're already reaching for your red pens, I hope, on that one. So I have um, I've, I multiplied each term in that Fourier in that in that expansion by cosine of m omega, m omega naught t. I draw the integral across each one. I, I bring out my constants this time just to make the identification of those a little bit easier. That what we want to do a little bit easier. And I'm, I'm interchanging the order of sums and, of sums and cosine of sums of, su of a summation and integration. So I'm integrating term by term this, this long expression. And now help me out here. What do I do to this term, the the the, the a naught term? It dies. Why? The integral goes to zero. Yep, and over a period. Okay. Um, 
Now, what about this guy down here? Why? Orthogonality. Excellent. Sines and cosines are orthogonal. And so these guys go away. Now, what about this guy here? So, so this is going to equal zero if n not equal to m or it equals, what did I say, t naught over 2? If and only if n is equal to m. So if uh, n is not equal to m, then it's zero. But if and only if n is equal to m, then that's equal to t naught over 2. So almost all of these terms go away. Almost all of those terms go away. And so I'm left with And so I'm left with a formula for, for each and every A. A's come in terms of A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 3, A sub 4. And so what I do is I pick the harmonic of the cosine that I want. I multiply it, or I take the dot product with f of t. So I multiply it and, and sum over those vectors. So if I'm, thinking of, if I'm thinking about f of t as a vector of numbers, and I'm thinking of cosine as a vector of numbers, then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking at the overlap. I'm doing the dot product. So I'm looking at how much of f of t is lined up with or parallel with the, the cosine of m omega naught t. And the visualization is fine if you're in 3D space, but if you're in space of 3,273, it gets a little bit tricky to, to visualize that. But it's still a dot product, and you still, and you still have that. More... more um, more, uh, uh, more practically, I suppose, uh, this just gives us the, the, the way of calculating what a sub, m, a sub m is. So we now have, we now have a naught, and we have all the other higher harmonics of, for, for the cosine terms. Okay. I, will, I will just merely write down So, so for to do the to do the to get the b's, we multiply both sides by sine of m omega naught t. Then we integrate over t naught. I'm going to leave a little space there, and, and and you should leave a little space in your notebook, and when you're bored tonight, missing me sometime over the next couple of weeks, you should fill in the one step that we did above with the signs, just to remind yourself of what we're doing, because now. We, were, we know, we can see we, can, we know we can see what the um, what the prescription is, what the mathematical prescription is for getting the B sub M's. And again, it represents, uh, if you read in physical interpretation, it represents the, uh, the dot product between the vector f of t and the, and the vector sine of m omega naught t. Okay? The projection of one onto the other. Okay? Very powerful, very nice uh, approach. To my mind, this is a really beautiful expression. 
This is the trigonometric Fourier series. This is the trigonometric Fourier series. If we use Euler's relationship, e to the j omega naught t is equal to, look at that, that's really stretching it. e to the j omega naught t is equal to cosine omega naught t plus j sine of omega naught t. Then I can factor out the b's and the a's into, uh, I'll use an alpha. So I can have a I can have a I can have a Fourier series that's expressed as a complex exponential. And this this coefficient alpha sub k this coefficient alpha sub k is given by the projection of x of, t of uh, I guess I should write this as F, since we were looking at F before. Uh, it's the projection of the F of t function on the on that on that um, the harmonic is, but the, now the harmonic functions are written as um, as complex exponentials. And at first glance, that says, "Wow, you, that's we've we've saved some notation because now we have a's, a's, <coughs> some, we have alpha sub k instead of a's and b's." But that's not that's, that's not really true. Because remember, this guy here is complex. It's cosine plus j omega t, cosine plus j sine. So this has this has um, two pieces to it, which mean. And it, so if this guy is a real voltage, if it's a real signal, if it's a real voltage, no complex part, then alpha sub k is going to be complex no matter what. So I have two pieces of information here. The amount of the amount of the signal that goes with the cosine and the amount the amount of the signal that goes with the sine, and I have exactly two pieces of information here: the amount of the signal that goes with the cosine and the amount of the signal that goes with the sine. And I'm just doing my bookkeeping. Instead of doing my bookkeeping by alpha by a and b, I'm doing my bookkeeping by the real part of alpha versus the imaginary part of alpha. So I'm using complex notation, and here's the punchline. I'm using complex notation to keep track of phase. Okay? Okay? So I'm using complex notation to keep track of track of phase. And that's all <laughs> You know, that, that's really all that the, the, the square root of minus one is, is good for as far as, well, it's probably one of the most important things that the square root of minus one is good for is to keep track of phase. Certainly whenever we use it in sines and cosines, that's what we're doing. So if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're now thinking in terms of, well, why, you're so used to using square root of minus one. You're so used to writing down J. And, and maybe you've thought of this, maybe you haven't, but, but if you haven't thought of it, you know, what, all, what you're really doing with it is just a bookkeeping notation to keep track of what's in phase with the cosine and what's out of phase with the cosine. What's in phase with the cosine and what's in phase with the sine. Again, 90 degrees apart. So, so the real part is orthogonal to the imaginary part. So J, J, is, J represents almost a vector notation. It almost, revect, it, almost, it almost looks like, a, to me, it looks like a unit vector. A sub X versus A sub Y. I, J, K. I don't know if you, what, what notation you use when you looked at vector expansions. But the, you have a unit vector in the x direction, unit vector in the y direction, unit vector in the z direction. J, J looks to me like it's playing that role in, in, in this basis set here. And that's a very, I bring that up not, it's because that goes far beyond Fourier series. Okay. It goes, in, it goes into a lot of, the, a lot of the, our use of sines and cosines in electrical engineering. Okay. So, and, 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 and then now, we'll, now we'll get into a little bit of a, di, a, di, a digression that's also a diatribe. Um, and that is, and that is, you know, I it, personally, even though I use complex notation all the time, personally, there's no reason for it. There's no reason to have 
um, sines and cosines. There's no reason to have complex exponentials. They make some of the some of the proofs a little bit easier, but if you're really if you're really if you're careful, if you're careful, you can you can get around that always by taking by considering uh, the sine and the cosine term, or just the cosine of an omega not, of an omega t plus a theta, a phase shift, because it's that theta that determines the relative amount of the cosine and the sine. That theta determines whether you're lined up 100% with the sine. 100% with the cosine, or stuck, or how, how far between the two you are in phase. Okay, so so you have choice. You, you have choices here, and so and some problems are and some problems are easier in one way and versus another way. And it's funny as I as I go through more and more problems, I I'm, I become more and more convinced that that you know a lot of times the trigonometric approach is is actually cleaner and and more straightforward and more intuitive breeds more intuition than, than, the, uh, than, the, than the complex notation. However, I say that with a big caveat, and that is when you start getting into intuit in what's intuitive, it's very different to different people. It, it, it's very, very different to different people. And so, and so there are some people, so, uh, some people that would, would with, good, with good reasons with them in themselves, think exactly the other way, that the complex notation is much more intuitive than the trigonometric. And I, and, and I won't argue with that because that's some people like chocolate ice cream and some people like vanilla ice cream. Right? So, all right. Now, um, are you ready to throw something at me? Yeah, the uh, case that it's not a yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so um, this function that's not periodic. Now, the story that I'm remembering is, um, like, you know, Fourier came up with all this stuff, right? Fourier came up with all this stuff, and, and uh, does anyone know the story of, of what he, of how he how he came up with it? What was it? That's what I remember too. That's what I remember too. Uh, so if nobody has a, a better story, then that's that's the his version of history I'm I'm sticking to. His his um, and I'll, I'll circle back into this this problem too. Our, our um, he was solving. Not the wave equation, but in fact the diffusion equation. And the diffusion equation, the wave equation is second order in time, second order in space. The, uh, the, uh, the, the diffusion equation is second order in time, first order, uh, second order in space, first order in time. So it's a very different system. The, the wave equation, you expect sines and cosines. The diffusion equation, you don't expect sines and cosines. But he wasn't solving the wave equation, he was solving the diffusion equation, and he was solving the diffusion equation for heat applied to the end of a metal bar. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to find at any given distance and any given time what the temperature distribution was. And you can imagine, you can imagine that, you know, the tip is going to get hot first, the tip is going to get hotter, and some of the, some of the heat is going to diffuse in, and eventually the rod is going to be burn, is going to get hot. So if I'm holding it here, eventually I'm going to I'm going to burn my fingers, but not right away. Okay. Now, is there anything sines and cosines at all about those those curves that I've intuitively drawn? Well, we solved this problem. He, uh, I should put um, metal bar. to distinguish, um, for example, watering holes. Um, so, 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 so you see that this, 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 the, 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 he was solving this equation. There's nothing about this. He solved this equation He solved this by, by assuming the tra a, tra a, a, a sinusoidal series, a series, a, a, a Fourier, what we call a Fourier series now. He, um, he put this, he, does, he wasn't sure of his solution. This is a story that I, I, I remember. It may or may not be right. But he, he was unsure of the solution, so he put it in an envelope to be opened after his death so that he would get credit for it if he was right and he, he wouldn't have to worry about the shame if he was wrong. Um, he came up with it intuitively in a very strange way. What he did was he made this, he says, okay, I'm only interested in, in, in a meter. 
And then if you say, uh, I'm, I'm interested in two meters, then, you, then he goes, okay, then I'm only interested in two meters. And if, and if you say, I'm only interested in three meters, then he'll say, okay, I'm only interested in three meters. So he said, I'm only interested in a finite number of meters of this length of rod. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve it, though, for an infinite rod. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that infinite rod, and because it's of infinite length, I'm going to roll it back on top of itself. So what he does is he, goes, he starts with a rod... He makes it longer, and then he curls it around on himself. So it has an infinite radius. And a circle with an infinite radius is a straight bar, again. Okay? And because, so because of this ring, that circle or that ring implies the periodicity. And his solution is only valid for that little piece of straight segment of the ring. Okay? And, and so that's, what, that's the technique that we're going to use. That's the technique that we're going to use um, for non-periodic functions, we're going to force them to be periodic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a non-periodic function. And I'm going to say I'm only interested in f of t across this range. I'm only interested in f of t across this range. So then I'm going to, maybe I'll leave a little bit of buffer. Maybe I'll leave a little bit of buffer, but I'm going to repeat this same function, whatever it is, again and again and again and again and again. And so now what I've done is by limiting my interest to a finite region of time, and if you tell me, if I say a minute, and you say no, a day, I'll say, okay, a day. And then if you come back and you say a week, I'll say, okay, a week. And if you come back and say a month, I'll say, okay, a month. It doesn't really matter because I'm, I'm just going to make this you know, if it's, if it's 10 years, 20 years lifetime of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a telecom system, then I'll just repeat it with a period of 20 years or 21 years, and, I, and I'll just keep, I'll, I'll, that'll be my basis, that'll be my expansion, fund my fundamental period. So now I'm, here's my, here's my new T-naught. So I cleaned things. I'm making things a little bit better, a little bit more uh, focused. If I have a period of time capital, uh, the period of time tau, I construct a I construct a, a periodic signal with the period larger than, t, than than tau, and then I'm right back onto page one. Okay, and my solution is only valid over this time. Fourier series, abbreviation Fourier series, the solution of the Fourier series is only valid for time tau. But that's okay because we agreed at the very beginning of the problem what, it, what, what, what tau we were interested in. And I'm sorry, but you can't have second thoughts. Once you, once you say I'm interested in, in 27 minutes... You can't come back to me and say, no, I meant, I meant 30. It doesn't work that way. If you mean 30, you should say it right up front. So don't waste, don't waste the time of calculating it. Okay?
But that's okay because if we if we if we if if, uh, if we do twenty seven and you say oh I was only interested in twenty five or twenty or twenty, that's fine too. Okay. So we could we so so there, there there's there's the way we turn there, there's the way we turn the non periodic into a periodic. So we can now do a Fourier series for any signal. Okay. Okay? Periodic or not? Huge, huge uh, advance. Okay. We have time for a couple of examples. We'll make time if we don't have time. Okay. Um, first example. I, I try to... Uh, okay, so full disclosure... Um, the tests are, three, let's say, three problems. One of them you've seen before because it's a homework, as homework problem. The other two are something are things that I, I come up with, and I come up with them largely from the reading and, and from the from the, uh, the the notes from my from my lectures. So as I as I'm giving me these lectures, I, I a brilliant, you know, brilliant ideas in quotes, <laughs> brilliant ideas for for test questions keep popping into my head. Okay. And, and I've been accused, or, or people have at least commented, that sometimes my questions are a little bit off the wall. And maybe that's true, maybe it isn't true. So what I try to do is, is at least lower the ambiguity of that and, lower, and, and, and try to you know, um, get you calibrated to my way of thinking for the test questions so you don't go into shock when you see them. And so, and so one of the ways of doing that is to sort of sprinkle in some of the questions that I've asked in the past and use them as examples. And so here's a question. Find the Fourier series. Find the Fourier series of this of this function cosine cubed of omega t. What do I do? Ah, brilliant. Brilliant. You could, and this is perfectly allowable, you could throw this into the, to the, uh, to the, to the equations and find all the A's and B's. Absolutely, and, and people answered it that way. And I will argue, and, and, and what I've noticed from the answers is that the people who did the, who, who did the um, exponential were, had a lot easier time with this than the people who did the, the trig. Okay? But, that's, but you could do it either way. You could do it either way. So there's three ways of doing it. You can calculate the A's and B's in accordance with what we've just learned. You can calculate, calculate the alphas in the accordance that we've just learned. Or you can say, hey, what is the trig identity? And I don't remember this trig identity, which is one of the reasons I give you the, um, the appendix E. And this trig identity is one-fourth times three cosine of omega T plus cosine of three omega T. Okay, so that gets us a good start. What do we do next? That gets us started. Great to say trig identity. Great to pull out the appendix E. What's our next step? Can't we what? Okay, good point. Good point. Now, now we can put this into the trig series and, and we, can use our, we can use our orthogonality. Now we can do that. Okay? Is there another approach? Uh, I'm sorry, do we go? So then do we follow these steps to multiply both sides by cosine? Yep. And then by sine? Yep. Okay. Yep, 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 yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another approach? I uh, take it home. Finish it up. Go ahead. What do I write next? I don't remember exactly. Um, 
You're, you're absolutely on the right track. Anyone want to help her? Can you factor three out? Pardon? Can you factor three out? You can factor three out. Well, it'll make it easier to see what she's saying. Yep, yep. Actually, to be honest, it, might, it, would, it would probably be easier to go the other way. I bet it's easier to look at it that way. Okay, let me help you out, because you're exactly on the right track. You just need to close it, okay? And this... The trick to the problem is, is, is recognizing when you, a Fourier series when you see a Fourier series, okay? So, what's A0 of this Fourier series? Good. What's B, what's any B sub M? Good. What is, so what are, what, are the, what are the two coefficients for the Fourier series? A sub 1 is equal to? Good. And A sub 3 is equal to? Perfect. There's your answer. Yes, sir. There's no signs in my Fourier series. Everything is in phase with the cosine, the original cosine. Yeah, that's the Fourier series. Find the Fourier series of that. And, and again, here we were done when we wrote this. This is the Fourier series. But the trick to the problem is recognizing a Fourier series when you hold it in your hot little hand. Okay. So that so again that's why that's where that's where the that's where the twist of this of this problem came from, okay, and and and, and so and so again the the emphasis is you can calculate all this, and and if you go down and, and you should try this if you go down and you and you and you and you substitute any of these expressions into the Fourier series, the the, the formulas it'll pop right out, and you it'll be a nice illustration of the dot products um, t- taking place. But, but, it, but in fact, what, what, um, uh, what, what, what it, but, but, but then you're just, you're, you're sort of calculating with blinders on. You're just turning the crank and you're not thinking about what, what exactly you, you want. And what you want is you want a set, a set of sines and cosines that describe your original function. And you've got it right after the trig identity. Okay? So, so I like this, I like doing this example. I like, I, I really love giving this homework, this, this test problem because, it forces you to, to, to appreciate, you know, and to think about think about the Fourier series in a little bit better, a little bit higher plane. Okay. Um, this cosine cubed is, we'll, we'll we'll come back to. Um, we will do problems. Um, we'll do problems where the channel. I haven't really talked to you what a what a com system is is comprised of, but there's a there's a transmitter, there's a channel, and there's a detector. I'll come back to that when we need to. Um, so, so when the channel is nonlinear, like when the transmission line or when the fiber optic cable is nonlinear, then you've got you've got some uh, distortions on it, and this will, in the context of that, we'll we'll look at this cubic um, nonlinearity, and we'll see. We'll, 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 when the time comes, we'll analyze um, we'll analyze the distortions that way. Okay. So that's a when I do this review, I'm trying to do reviews that that. Uh, I'm trying to do examples where we'll have to do it later on down the line anyway. And so the fact that I do it up front, then when, then when we see it in, in four or five weeks, then we'll, we'll, um, we'll already have seen the, the example. And the math, the math will be, we may not remember it, but the math will be familiar or more familiar than it was before. All right. With that in mind, I'll do a more conventional example. So I'm going to pick a square pulse. Square pulses will also come up a lot, a lot, a lot in this course. So learning, learning, how, learning how to see what the what the um, 
the Fourier series and the Fourier transform of this, of this function is, is going to be a, a useful one. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the professor's license by making this really nice. Um, it starts at minus T1, it goes up to 1, and it, comes, it turns off at capital T1. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to find the Fourier series. So without, oh, and it's zero everywhere else. Okay? So the first thing I, I'll ask you is, uh, what are the Bs? Zero because it's going to be even and only use cosine. Awesome. Excellent answer. So the answer, so I had the question was, why, what are Bs? And the, and, and the answer was, B, all the Bs are equal to zero. And the rationale, the reason for that is, this, I'm starting with an even function. And if I look at my... If I look at my, my trigonometric Fourier series, um, I'm breaking it up into an even part, where all the cosines are, and an odd part, where all the sine parts are. So any function can, in fact, be broken up into an even part and an odd part. In the Fourier series, the cosines own the even part, and the sines own the odd part. And so in my example, I don't have an odd part. And so, and so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have any sines. And so all the b's are going to be zero. So the b's are equally zero because of their, their, they're going to they're be an even function. Yeah? If there were b's, would some of the function be flipped Could, over the next half? Um, if I slide this just a little bit smidgen to the right or to the left, if I slide it to the, to the right or the left, in fact, let me, let me go ahead and do that. Um, Supposing I, sl I slide this just to a little bit to the, this is T1 plus an epsilon, and this is minus T1 plus the epsilon. You see now that this, this, this red pulse is no, long, does, no longer has parity. Okay. And so there's going to be an even part and an odd part to this. Okay? And so, and so because, of that, because of that, I'm going to have some Bs. Okay? For a number of reasons, I'll... Just redraw everything. Okay. So 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 there's my there's my um, there's my x of t. What do what do I do next? Is it does it have a period? Does it repeat? Does it as I've written it? Does it have a period? No, it's non-periodic. It's not periodic, so I can't find a capital T naught. So now what do I? So now what do I do if I can't find one? I force one. I force one. So I have to pick a time over which I'm interested in this function. Okay, and it's I could I, I obviously I'm interested in the function from minus t1 to t1, but if I pick that as, a, as a, if I pick t1 or two t1 as my period, then I'm going to have pretty much a straight line all the way through, a DC component all the way through. And I have a feeling if I do that, I'm going to miss the transition 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. So if I care about that transition, if I care about that transition, I'm going to, I'm going to have to leave a little bit of a buffer. So what I'll do is I'll pick my period to be much bigger than, to be bigger by a little bit of map, by a little bit or a lot, and we'll take a look at that when we when we do our calculations. Uh, then the um, then the function itself. So are you saying if you pick period B, what did you say, uh, T1? The period that if you, if you had to pick the other period, you were saying you, you couldn't distinguish when it turns on or off. Yeah, the, the, I'll go back to this my my my, my sloppy piece of paper here or my special case piece of paper here. So, suppose my period, T0, was equal to 2T1, okay? In which case, my, repeat, my repeating would be this, okay? And if I continue this out, it would be all the way out. 
And so if I look at that, if that's a DC term. That's a battery. That's a DC term. And so that's just going to give me an A sub zero. And an A sub zero is not going to adequately describe the pulse. It's going to adequately describe what's inside the pulse. But it doesn't take into account the transition up and down. Because there's no transition up and down with the blue line. Okay? So maybe that's what you want. But if it's what you want, then you shouldn't have written a pulse. If it's what you want, you should have just written a, a, you know, a line like that. Okay? So, so, so does, that, does that make sense? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll... Um, how do I do this? So there's my there's the beginning of my of my infinite um, set of pulses. So I start with the one that I care about, and then I construct um, so make the a periodic x of t into a periodic function x of t where x of t equals x of t plus capital T naught. Okay? So there's the limit over which we're, we care about. So we went ahead and, and we went ahead and, and um, started talking about B's and A's. But let me just to mix things up here a little bit. Let me just do the A sub K. So I'll do A. I'll do A sub zero first. Uh, sorry, the alpha sub zero. Okay. So I'll do I'll do the exponential for A series. So that means finding all the alphas. So the first alpha will be alpha naught is equal to 1 over t naught integrated from t1 to t2. To t and this guy is equal to twice t1 over t naught. That's just the turn the crank answer. You'll notice that that's real. That's real. I won't make a big deal about that just yet. But I also now, if we go a little bit beyond the mathematics of it, we now look at what, we, what, what that ratio is. And 2t1 is the length of the pulse, the length of the time that a voltage is actually on my signal. And t0, for this new function, for the periodic function, t0 is the amount of time that it's off. So 2t1 over t0 is a ratio of two times, it's dimensionless, and it's the ratio of the amount of time, of the percentage of time that it's on, divided by off. Does anyone have a word for that? Very good. So the physical interpretation of that ratio of alpha sub naught happens to be the duty cycle of the, of the pulse train. Okay.
So now we'll find the rest of them. And the first thing to note out note is that because of the because of the simplicity of the function, I'm just not, I'm not drawing a one there, but there's there there may there may be a one there is a one there. That's the function, and then this is the kernel, K E R N A L of the Fourier series. Then then uh, then uh, that's, that actually turns out to be a fairly simple fun, fairly simple integral to do. It's just it's just the integral of a complex exponential across two two times. So do the integral. Evaluated at the limits of integration. It's a little sloppy. I apologize for that. So let me read it out to you. It's 2 over k omega naught t naught. Um, I've collected, I've taken this j and I've moved it underneath the, in the denominator here. And I multiplied through by 2 and, and, and divided two by, by 2. So I multiplied through by 1. And what that allows me to do is have a 2j in that denominator. That 2j is really nice because here I have an e to the j something minus e to the minus j something over 2j. And this guy here is the sign of k omega naught t1. Okay. As soon as I do that, what have I done to the square root of minus 1? I've just gone away. And so my alphas now are purely real. Alpha sub k's are purely real. And where do I write this? That's the same thing as saying that the original function was an even function. So when I set up my periodicity, a sneaky thing I did that I didn't mention, a sneaky thing I did was I kept the same periodicity. I kept the same parity. Sorry. I kept the same parity. I could have, I could have slid it over a little bit. I suppose. Actually, that would be a good test question to see, what, see what, if I could do that. Right. But, but regardless, as I, as I constructed my, my pulse train from my single pulse, I maintained parity. I kept it an even function. And then the alphas, remember the, the, the real part of the alpha goes with the cosine and the imaginary part of the alpha goes with the, with the sines. And so, and so the, the imaginary part goes away. Not an accident. So my alpha sub k Looks like that. Notice that this omega dot is 2 pi over t naught.
so I can simplify the denominator a little bit. Okay. And there's my answer, by the way. There's my answer. If I know what my T1 is, and I know what my T0 is, I can substitute into here. I'm looking for alpha sub 1, alpha sub 2, alpha sub 3, alpha sub 4, and I just need to plot, plot in what the Ks are for that. Oh, um, I could. Sure. Sure. Well, two pies are nicer than pies. But, yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, the, the nice thing about two pies is I've got a two pie up there as well. But, yeah, sure. It's not a, not a big deal. Um, at least it's not wrong. At least it's not a wrong factor or two. <laughs> so it may be ungainly and unsightly, but at least it's not wrong. Um, so a case. Um, there it is. T naught is equal to four T one. So that tells me something about my duty cycle. It tells me how much of how much breathing room I have on both sides. And so for this particular case, I have that. Notice um, the sneaky way at which I write the ratio here because I'm left with a ratio here. And the T-naughts cancel there. So that this equals um, pi times k in the denominator. What's, what do I have left over? The sine of pi over 2 times k. And if I plot this, zero, one, minus one, two, two, three, four, minus four, or zeros, five are up and so on and so forth. So you see I have a sinusoid that changes um, with, a, with a pi over two period. So, every, so k equals zero. I have a zero over zero. That's a one. I have at k equals one. I've got sine of, uh, pi over, sine of 90 degrees divided by pi. And then at, at, um, at sine of, uh, at, at, at a k equals two, I have a sine of pi, which is zero. Yes? The, the infinite axis is your k values, correct? Absolutely right. So is that just like one half of a sync function? I don't want to say sync function yet. Okay. I don't want to say what a sync function is. It's, it, looks like, it begins to look like a sync function, right? It begins to look like a sync function after I make this ratio. Right. After I make the ratio argument, okay? Then it begins to look like a sync function. But it's also, but notice it's not... It's a it's a discrete time sync function. So so you may so that's that's very different. That's very different from the sync function that we learned about before, which was a a continuous time. I'm flashing. I'm about to be out of time, and I've got more to do on this example. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to break for 15 minutes, and then when I come back, what I'll do is I'll review. Take the, continue on with the example, but I'll take a running start, and, we'll, and, we'll, and, and a lot of these points we'll bring up again, okay?